Welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation Expert Briefings. The event will begin shortly. There will be a short introduction by our moderator, followed by today's presentation. After the presentation, we will address questions from our web audience during a Q&A session. Please note that questions can be submitted by clicking on the Q&A icon in the black banner on the bottom of your viewing page. Due to our limited time, we can only address questions that are most pertinent to the topic. I will turn this event over to today's moderator. Hi there, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Dr. James Beck, and welcome to our fourth webinar in the Parkinson's Foundation 11th Expert Briefing Series. Our topic today is on food, water, and supplements. Does nutrition play a role in PD symptoms and progression? And uh, I think you can guess the answer for that one. Um, as you can tell, i uh, working in a different location than I typically am, and um, not in the foundation offices in New York City. I think these are unusual times for us all. And uh, what the foundation is doing to help address it is we have a lot of information on our website. And in fact, we're going to be hosting a Facebook Live uh, session tomorrow, uh, Wednesday at 10 a.m. Um, with Dr. Michael Oaken and uh, Dr. Frederick. Um, Dr. Oaken is a movement disorder specialist who uh, is at our Center of Excellence at University of Florida and his colleague, Dr. Frederick, who's an infectious disease specialist. We'll be talking um, to uh, lay your fears about uh, the impact of, of COVID-19 um, on Parkinson's disease and what you can do uh, to minimize your risk and um, address issues that uh, questions you might have at that time. Um, what I want to introduce you to is uh, the slides that you have. They're on your, on your screen. You see the title slide. Hopefully you see a picture of me as well. Um, at the bottom, um, there will be a, a chat where information will be uh, pushed out to you um, by my colleagues. Um, in this particular case, there's a, a link um, for uh, the Facebook um, uh, live session that we'll have, as well as now there's going to be uh, slides that you can download, um, which will have the links embedded in, as well. So if you want to see Dr. Mishley's slides and click along with them uh, after, um, as, as she goes or afterwards, you can, you can do that. Um, if you have questions that you want to ask, click on the Q&A uh, button uh, that's in the lower uh, center of the screen, uh, it says Q&A. And from there, you can ask uh, questions um, that will be relayed uh, to me and that I can um, ask uh, Dr. Mishley uh, those questions as well. Um, so <clears throat> I also want to just mention that uh, you know, this webinar is being recorded. So if you need to step out of the room or if you find this um, fascinating and want to share it with friends, uh, we'll have the link live tomorrow. So this is being recorded, so you don't have to uh, work um, furiously taking notes. Um, and I want to add that uh, we'll be making this available as a, a CEU credit for those of you who um, are uh, eligible for um, these continuing education unit uh, credits. So it's one free CEU. Um, and if you uh, click on the link uh, that's now posted in the Q&A, um, this is for health professionals, um, then you can um, uh, do what you need to do in order to register, and there will be a follow-up email uh, tomorrow. Uh, just remember, if you do want to uh, watch this webinar for CEU credit, you have until 30 days, which is April 17th, to collect your free CEU. Um, so um, you can download the slides in advance, um, uh, go back to that uh, Q&A if you've uh, missed this link, and you can find uh, the link that you need to do. Um, so we've got the uh, couple questions I want to be able to ask uh, everyone uh, just to get a sense for uh, where we are. And just uh, Dr. Mishley has a number of polls that she wants to uh, uh, quizzes, if you will, to ask of people. So what I would like if you to do, um, just uh, reply to this poll, which is uh, posted on your screen. Just let us know, are you a person with Parkinson's? Uh, are you a care partner? Um, do you have a family member with PD? Are you a healthcare professional, a, a scientist, a researcher? So, um, we'll wait just a few minutes, and uh, as those results come in, um, just to determine who is our audience today. We have over 4,300 people who have registered, um, and so we know we have um, people of all different stripes who are, who are listening in. So let's just give it another few seconds um, to do that. And we can close that poll at any moment. Great. And as you can see, we've got a lot of people with Parkinson's who are uh, listening in, uh, care partners, 
a lot of healthcare professionals, which is great. Uh, those CEUs are for you. Um, don't forget uh, to claim those CEUs. Um, we'll have this webinar recorded and made available uh, tomorrow. So the next thing I want to ask is, where are you from? Um, you know, with this many registrants, we have people from all over the world, I suspect. Um, give us a sense of where you're from. Um, you know, respond to this poll, which is just up here. Are you from the U.S., Canada? Are you from, are you from Australia? We have people from all over the world who are, who are participating typically. So um, let's just give a few seconds to see where people are from. And these polls which are appearing are going to be the same polls that Dr. Mishley uh, will use during her uh, seminar too, just to ask some questions to understand uh, where you are and vis-a-vis uh, -vis her presentation. So let's give it another few seconds. Okay. And let's see those results. I think it's gonna remain a mystery. My colleagues are working in the background to get these, this poll published. Oh, so we just push the poll again. I guess we're gonna re-ask everyone the question um, where they're viewing from. So if you could just fill that out again, that would be great. Must have had a little technical error. So let us know where you're from. <clears throat> Fantastic. Okay. Most are from the U.S., uh, not surprisingly. And we have uh, people from uh, a smattering from all over. Um, none from Asia. It's kind of early in the morning um, for most places. So uh, that's not surprising. But again, we're recording this session and we'll be able to, um, those individuals will be able to come back and, and, um, uh, listen to Dr. Mishley in her presentation. So now let me just move on with our agenda and just let me introduce our speaker. Um, it's, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Mishley, um, uh, ND, PhD, and MPH. She's from the Bastyr University Research Institute uh, and Seattle Integrative Medicine. Um, Dr. Uh, Mishley uh, studied naturopathic medicine at Bastyr University and epidemiology and nutritional sciences, where she has her MPH and PhD, uh, respectively, at the University of Washington. Uh, her work is focused on identifying the nutritional requirements unique to individuals with neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's. She's published uh, extensively on um, nutritional supplements such as coenzyme Q10, lithium, and glutathione, and has, has done some uh, work uh, regarding that. Um, so uh, she has uh, maintains a clinical practice at Seattle Integrative Medicine and uh, is focused, uh, needless to say, on nutrition and neurologic health. So uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Mishley and um, for the rest of the presentation. Welcome, Dr. Mishley. Thank you, thanks for the invitation to be here. This is a topic I'm obviously pretty passionate about, and I'm thrilled to see that so many of you are interested in this topic. So here are, let me just get control of the slides here. Here are my disclosures. So what I wanna do is first start by redefining or defining the word nutrition for you. So often when I say that I study nutrition, the first thing people do is think about broccoli and carrots and assume that my work is all about what you should eat. And the first thing I need to convey is that nutrition is about so much more than food. Food can be an excellent source of nutrition. It can also be a source of anti-nutrients. And there are a lot of nutrients that come from places other than food. So there are these scientific terms, endogenous and exogenous. If you can produce it yourself, you don't need it from your environment. But if there is something that we must source from our environment that we need in order to survive and thrive, it by definition is a nutrient. So oxygen is a nutrient. If we take it away, your health suffers. Um, gravity, if you go up in space, your bones start to weaken and fall apart. We have evolved to need gravity. Vitamin D is a nutrient that we don't get from food, we get it from the sun. So I am especially interested in kind of expanding our idea of where one gets its, our nourishment from. And it's not all about food. So what I wanna do is start by just throwing some curveballs at the very beginning. Um, what we have been doing for the last seven years is a study uh, of 2,200 people with Parkinsonism from around the world. And what we do is every six months we send people a survey and we ask them a whole bunch of questions about themselves. And the data that I'm gonna be presenting here today uh, is looking at their baseline data. And so 
what we did is we took only the people who said that they had idiopathic Parkinson's disease and we asked them about their overall health, Parkinson's severity, symptoms, and quality of life. And what we learned is of all the things that we are studying, loneliness is the single biggest predictor of Parkinson's progression. And that's not really surprising when you think about it. There's an entire field of study devoted to how humans need social interaction. And if you are put in isolation, your mental and physical health begins to suffer. This is the first time these, that, that field of study has been specifically applied to Parkinson's disease. And I was expecting loneliness to be associated with worse outcomes. I was not expecting it to be the single biggest predictor of Parkinson's progression. Similarly, um, exercise is a nutrient. Um, think of it as, you know, as you heat up your body and you pump blood through your system and you move and twist your, body, your muscles, it's almost like wringing out the dirty sponge as you kind of clear out lymphatic tissue and things like that. And the human body needs to move and get rid of its waste products and increase circulation. Our data says that the more days per week that you exercise, the fewer Parkinson's symptoms people were reporting over time. Uh, according to these data, the first couple days a week don't even make a very robust difference in overall Parkinson's progression. The real benefit started when you got to three days a week or more. And each day after that, the benefits got a little bit better. The way we asked the question was, how many of the last seven days have you done at least 30 minutes of exercise? And you can see from these data, more is better. I put um, the loneliness and the exercise slide together on the same page because I think it's really impactful to see that statistically speaking, um, being lonely is worse for you than seven days a week of exercise is good for you. And so it is easy for us to talk about the importance of exercise. I want you to go exercise. I think that we need to equally start talking about the importance of plugging into your community, reaching out to go participating in support groups, going to your exercise programs, because um, I really do think that social connection is going to be part of a therapeutic strategy for Parkinson's disease. Sleep is needed by the human body. Um, I'm not sure where that fits into the nutritional spectrum, but I think it's something that doesn't get nearly as much attention as it should. About 50% of people with Parkinson's complain that they have impaired sleep, disrupted sleep. And the research that exists suggests that sleep is associated with faster Parkinson's progression and uh, worse, worse outcomes in Parkinson's disease. And some of the questions that they use when they do those studies are, they look at people who are nodding off when they're watching TV or if they're passenger in somebody's car, um, that, that puts them at increased risk for faster Parkinson's progression if you have some of those symptoms. So these are things that I think we need to kind of wrap into the lifestyle um, conversation. So here's the first quiz that I wanted to throw out at you. Um, according to our CAMCARE study data, which of these is a, the biggest predictor of faster Parkinson's progression? Is it not exercising? Is it not getting a good night's sleep? Or is it being lonely? I gave you the answer on this one. I think the next couple of quizzes, I actually throw the question out to you before I give you the answer. So let's see what the answer is for this. Great. And every single one of these is associated with faster Parkinson's progression, according to our data set. Um, but true enough, as most of you answered, being lonely was the biggest predictor of Parkinson's progression. So I, before I get into the answers that you're all here to learn, um, let me just take a couple minutes to talk about how to study nutrition and how difficult it is to study nutrition. There is a big difference between looking at treating symptoms or slowing progression about who gets Parkinson's disease or how, whether or not Parkinson's progresses fast or slow, um, whether we're looking at motor symptoms, non-motor symptoms. This has tremendous implications for how we design studies, how many people need to be enrolled, what type of person needs to be enrolled. So examples of symptomatic treatment for Parkinson's would be, you know, L-DOPA for tremor, fiber for constipation, a Mediterranean diet for depression, fish oil for dyskinesia, uh, melatonin for sleep. Those are all ways that we might use nutrition to study Parkinson's symptoms. What I'm really more interested in is the idea that nutrition may play a role in Parkinson's disease progression. So, um, 
there, historically, we have always done what we call traditional epidemiology studies. And what that means is we look at people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and we look at kind of what foods they're eating, whether they're single or married, whether they get a good night's sleep, what pills and supplements and pharmaceuticals they take. And then we ask, do they or do they not get a diagnosis of Parkinson's? In the traditional epidemiologic study, the study ends the day of diagnosis. What I'm interested in is cl clinical epidemiology, where the study starts the day you're diagnosed. I don't really care how you got to be here. What I want to know is from this point forward, is there something that you can do that will shape the rate of your Parkinson's progression? So for instance, we have at least five studies right now that say the more dairy you eat over the course of your life, the more likely you are to wind up with a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And there's a whole bunch of disagreement or ideas floating around the field about whether it's the pesticides in the dairy, whether it's altering the microbiome, whether, I mean, we don't know why. We don't know why that is, but we pretty consistently see that dairy increases a person's risk of Parkinson's diagnosis. And so what has happened is people go into their neurologist and they say, should I stop eating dairy? And the true answer is we don't know. We have never taken a group of people with Parkinson's disease and had some of them avoid dairy, some of them continue consuming dairy, and looked to see does it shape Parkinson's progression moving forward. Those studies just haven't been done yet. And that's what I'm trying to bring to the table is this idea of once diagnosed, are there dietary things that we can do that influence the rate of Parkinson's progression? Um, this is especially exciting as the world opens up to appreciate this idea of prodromal Parkinson's. Parkinson's Foundation and a couple other places are doing a fabulous job launching these genetics initiatives. I think more primary care providers are starting to become aware of things like uh, diminished arm swing, loss of smell, REM sleep behavior disorder, as being some early warning signs that somebody may be on their way to a Parkinson's diagnosis. Um, I, I've been working on some early detection stuff. I think that we are getting to a place where in the next few years, we are going to be able to detect people before they develop motor symptoms of Parkinson's. And this question about how to slow the disease is going to become ever more important as we get start diagnosing people or telling people that they are at increased risk of diagnosis in their 30s. They don't have symptoms yet that can be treated with dopamine, but they still have we still have reason to believe that they have Parkinsonism and the process has already begun. So as we get into the world of early diagnosis and identifying people at increased risk, the demand for disease modifying therapies is only going to grow stronger and stronger. So um, we don't yet know whether or not you can change your behaviors and decrease the rate of Parkinson's progression. But I wanted to show this slide because I wanted to show the impact of getting started early. So this, these, the, what you're looking at here are 2,200 dots on the screen. And every one of those dots on that chart is a real person with Parkinson's. And when we draw kind of the statistical average line, that big black line through the center is the average rate of Parkinson's disease progression. At diagnosis, a typical person's score is about 580 and they get worse at about 38 points per year. And so what I did is drew that dotted line to show you if, if at the day of diagnosis, right above that zero, if at the day of diagnosis you cut your rate of progression in half, you can see the impact that that's going to make. Over a year or two, it might not make that much of a difference. But if you're 40 years old and you're going to live to be 80 or 90, a 50% reduction in slope translates to a very meaningful impact in your overall quality of life. Look at if we could get to this disease early, if we could use some of um, these genetics initiatives and some of these screening tests that we have to alert people that they are at increased risk of Parkinson's disease and we could get them to adopt some behaviors that are associated with a 50% reduction in slope. Look at how much more substantially the impact of that is over the next 40, 50, even 60 years. So I really do think that this is what the next 5, 10 years of Parkinson's is going to look like. Um, 
studying disease modification gets really, really complicated. The outcome measures that we have historically used have focused on motor symptoms. And according to our data, two thirds of people's symptoms are non-motor symptoms. So it has been really difficult to come up with a, a scale that does a good job looking at slope of Parkinson's progression. So we had to build one ourselves for the purpose of this study. And the next step will be to see if we can implement some of these changes, can we start to see the shape of the line decrease? So before I dive into the results, let me just kind of tell you what this outcome measure entails so you can decide whether or not you believe it or trust it. But one of my pet peeves in the field of Parkinson's is that we have historically defined this disease by what the physician can see. We measure your rigidity, we look at your arm swing, we look at your posture, we observe your tremor. It has been historic ignored that we pay much attention to things like disrupted sleep and fatigue and bowel issues. These are things that are harder for the physician to see. They're harder to rate. We can't rate your pain very easily. We can't rate your constipation very easily. And so those are a lot of things that have historically been slept, swept under the rug. And so what I wanted to do is shift from a provider-centered view of this disease to a patient-centered view of this disease. And what I wanted to do is use a rating scale that reflected the patient experience. So what we did is we had, came up with 33 very common symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and everyone gets a little slider bar. This, this outcome measure takes about five minutes to complete. It's free to get your score. And you go through each of these tabs, and if you don't have the symptom over the last week, you click to the left. If it's a little bit annoying, somewhere in the middle, and if it's severe and debilitating, you put the slider bar over to the right. And so what happens is you don't see it, but on the back end, every one of those lines is labeled 0 to 100. And we add up all of your scores, and, and you get a total pro-PD score to rate your overall Parkinson's severity. What is exciting about this is we have published uh, uh, the initial validation paper here, and we've shown that the higher your pro-PD score, the worse your quality of life, your social satisfaction, your mental health, your physical health. And we have shown that um, when we compare the pro-PD score to traditional measures of Parkinson's severity, years since diagnosis, UPDRS, HONIN-YAR, um, PDQ-39, some of these tests that we've used historically in, in studies, the pro-PD scale correlates very nicely with those outcome measures too. So once we realized that patients are fairly accurately able to tell their patients how severe their disease is, it's kind of a comical concept anyway that, that of course you can. You are, you are the only thing we care about. You know, just going back, the way this scale was designed was I started with what would be the definition, my definition of success. And if a patient with Parkinson's goes through this list of symptoms and every one of these tabs is a zero, I don't have any problem with falling. I don't have any problem rising from a seated position. I have no fatigue, no bowel issues, no apathy. I'm happy, right? And so the goal would be scoring a zero on this scale. And so that was kind of the, the how this scale was developed. So for this study, what we wanted to do is look to see who are the people who are progressing unusually fast, the red circle, and who are the people progressing super slow, doing better than everybody else. There are people who have had this disease for 20 years and they hardly have any symptoms. They are rating their quality of life as excellent and good. Who are those people and are they doing something different than the people in, in red? It's kind of simple, but it, it made sense to me. And I, I will say that the heterogeneity, the one of the big problems that has happened in the field of Parkinson's disease is there's so much diversity in this disease, it makes it really hard to study. No two people are the same. And so it, it is hard to design these double-blind placebo-controlled trials where group A and group B are completely identical except for that one variable that we're changing. Those studies have been shown over and over to not be working in Parkinson's disease. And so what I wanted to do is kind of flip the whole paradigm on its head and use the diversity of this disease to our advantage. Let's look at the people doing really, really well. Let's look at the people doing really poorly. And can we find out, some, find some differences in how these people eat and supplements they take and social factors, things like that. 
So I have these data presented in a couple different ways, but this is essentially kind of what we're looking at. And I'll give you in the next slide a little more clear data, but you get the idea. What we're seeing is that people who are eating fresh fruits and vegetables and essentially a Mediterranean diet are the ones that are doing the best. And um, the foods up in the top region we'll go through in a second. This, um, we, we, this is brand new data. So what has happened is we have previously published these data. When we had 50, when we had a thousand people in the data set, we wrote this up, we published it in a peer reviewed journal and that's not behind a paywall. Anyone can go and get the old, the previously published data um, from a couple of years ago. But so many poor people from around the world have joined this study that we now had over 2000 people in the data set and we thought it was time for an update. So we use the exact same methods we used last time, but we use our new expanded enhanced group of participants in the study. And so this is what the new data set looks like. Um, starting over here on the left, the impact of dietary behaviors and Parkinson's progression. Um, it's not all about food. It looks like there are some behavioral habits that we can see in people with the slowest rates of progression, people who cook most of their own meals and cook meals for others, people who avoid artificial flavors, sweeteners, and colors, um, people who buy from local co-ops and farmers markets, and people who say they try to eat organically grown food when possible, are all statistically doing better than people who say false to those statements. As I mentioned already, um, food scarcity is shocking. Um, people who find it difficult to afford, afford groceries, specifically healthy foods, have a much faster rate of Parkinson's progression. So for the scientists who may be tuning in, um, this was a cross-sectional analysis, but we every one of these analyses is adjusted for age, gender, income, and years since diagnosis. So we did our best um, when we talk about the foods to account for income, but but there's a lot going on here and in your income impacts your ability to afford gym memberships and, and it's much more far reaching than people realize. In terms of particular foods, this is what everyone wants to know, is there a Parkinson's diet? Um, there really isn't a Parkinson's diet, but if I had to pick one, it, I would say that the Mediterranean diet is looking best. According to our data, the people who are eating the most fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, nuts and seeds, non-fried fish, wine, olive oil, coconut oil, and fresh herbs are the people with the slowest rate of Parkinson's disease progression. And it's dose dependent. More is better. People who are eating five servings of fresh vegetables a day are progressing slower than people who have two servings of fresh vegetables a day. So this looks like a very Mediterranean diet to me. Um, I have a couple patients that play for points with their partners. They'll put this list on the refrigerator and every time you eat one of these foods, you get a point. The person who gets the fewest points each day has to do the dishes at the end of the night or something like that. Um, but I think that's a fun, clever way to start to try and target getting more and more of these foods in green in the, into your diet. The foods associated with the fastest rate of Parkinson's progression were canned fruits and canned vegetables, fried foods, soda, including diet soda, meat, specifically pork, chicken, and beef, um, dairy, specifically ice cream, yogurt, milk, and cheese, people who drank out of plastic bottles, frozen vegetables, and pasta were all associated on the faster progressing list. So let me just say, um, I think I said in a slide in a minute, association does not mean causation. I am not saying that broccoli's slow Parkinson's disease progression. What I'm saying is that the people who are progressing the slowest are eating the most fresh vegetables. And so we don't know what that means. It might be that fresh vegetables are contributing to a slower progressing disease. It could be that fresh vegetables are not interfering with your meds and making your medication more available. It could be that people who exercise the most eat the most fresh vegetables, and it's not really the fresh vegetables that are making the difference, it's the exercise. So even, this is really the beginning of starting to understand the relationship between food and diet and Parkinson's disease progression. And I do just want to drill home this idea that just because two things are associated with one another, A doesn't necessarily mean B. 
So when to implement, you know, everyone wants to know, you know, how much data do you wait for? There are going to be some people who end this, this webinar today and they're done. They changed their diet. They're done with the foods in the red. They're only going to eat the foods in green. End of story. There are other people who are going to wait for my data to be replicated by somebody else. There are other people who are going to wait for the longitudinal analysis of these data or a double blind placebo controlled trial. So I think all physicians are kind of faced with this conundrum. At what point do I ask my patients to act? This is not level one evidence. Um, in the world of medicine, level one evidence means that you've done double blind placebo controlled trials. And that's just not possible with diet. We can't randomize people to placebo carrots, broccoli, and fish, and legit real carrots, broccoli, and fish, and placebo cheeseburgers and milkshakes. So we will never be able to get level one evidence for diet. So we have to be able to work with, uh, with object of, um, observational data. So the second option would be to tell our patients, listen, the jury is still out, but based on what we do see, it looks like the Mediterranean diet is associated with slower Parkinson's disease progression. So again, the question about should, what, is there a Parkinson's disease diet? Um, again, I, I will say the jury is still out, but if we were going to apply the results of our data to a real world patient cohort, this is what the Parkinson's diet would look like based on our diet. Um, if, if your goal, if it makes sense to you that you want to do what the successful people with your disease are doing and avoid what the unsuccessful people are doing, this is what that diet would look like. So second quiz, um, as I said, it's really hard to do Parkinson's research. And so for those of you who are going to end this webinar and you start changing your diet pretty radically, I wanna ask, do you think that you are most likely to see an improvement in your motor symptoms, your non-motor symptoms, or your rate of progression? Okay, let's see what you chose. Probably, um, I recently, good, I think rate of progression is probably the right answer. I think non-motor symptoms, frankly, it could be all, we'll talk about this for a minute, but rate of progression is the answer I was looking for. Um, but I wanna also say how difficult it makes that on you, the patient, because progression is slow. And you're going to put a lot of work and a lot of energy into upheaval of your entire life. If you have a family, you've got a house full of teenagers that don't necessarily want to eat this way, um, there can be some frustrations and, and stress associated with, with, with behavior change. And you're not necessarily going to see immediate results. You know, you can do this for three months, for six months, for eight months. And if, if what we're expecting is a slower rate of Parkinson's progression, that means that you might not appreciate the benefits for years to come. And that makes it really hard and frustrating for the patient to not have that feedback to get going. Uh, fortunately, there is actually quite a bit of research that suggests that these same foods that are associated with slower Parkinson's progression may also improve non-motor symptoms. There have been two huge studies now that show that the Mediterranean diet is as effective as antidepressants for depression. Um, I would expect some of your non-motor symptoms to improve, and a lot of those foods on the green list are also very easily digestible ways to get dietary protein. And so when you eat meat and dairy, those proteins hang out in your gut a lot longer and they interfere with your medications a lot longer. So switching from, from animal-based protein to plant-based protein is probably also likely to make your levodopa work better and that might actually improve your motor symptoms. So in my clinic, I do see people reporting improvement in motor and non-motor symptoms, but where we'd really expect to see this from a study perspective would be rate of progression. So there are all kinds of popular diets out there, ketogenic diet, the Walls diet, Mediterranean diet, calorie restriction diets. They all have um, what we call biological plausibility, some good scientific reasons why we might want to consider them. What they all have in common is they get the refined um, processed foods out of the diet. Um, ketogenic diets tend to be higher in animal products. It's very hard to eat kind of a plant-based ketogenic diet. Um, as you saw in that other chart, 
fruit was the second most protective food against Parkinson's disease progression. And ketogenic diets make um, generally encourage people don't eat too much fresh fruit. And that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, but I do think all of these diets um, will benefit at least short term in making you more aware of what you're putting in your body, thinking through where your food is coming from, being more aware of the composition of what you're about to eat. There's a bunch of research coming out on calorie restriction diets. Um, and what that means is you don't have to fast, but what that tends to mean, um, I, I should have used the term intermittent fasting here instead of calorie restriction, but, but they're studied similarly. But um, in terms of intermittent fasting, what we're really talking about is, is condensing the amount, the, the hours in the day where you're actually eating. You, I don't want you to reduce your calories. Um, and I apologize for using calorie restriction here. I meant intermittent fasting. Um, but what you want to do is maybe stop eating for the three hours before bed and get at least 12 hours every day where you're not consuming any calories. So if you have your last meal, at, you end dinner at 7 o'clock, 7 to 10, you don't eat, go to bed at 10. So from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., you're not eating anything. And so there are a bunch of researchers looking at how a 12-hour fast every night or even a 14 and 16-hour fast every night keeping the same foods and, and nutritional calories during the day, but squeezing them all tighter together are at, seems to be very, very good for brain health and overall longevity. People, um, I'll just go back and say people who are already wrestling with weight loss, intestinal malabsorption issues, they lack appetite, this can be really difficult for people. And this is something that um, you really have to make sure that if you are going to start to do this 12 hour fast at night, you don't skimp on calories during the day. We are not asking you to reduce calories, especially if your weight is normal or underweight. Um, but most people don't, on a, if you do an intermittent fast, you don't tend to lose weight. Weight loss is a huge problem with Parkinson's disease, and there are a lot of different reasons for that. Um, the, there's apathy, there's loss of smell, there's um, lack of appetite. If you're constipated, nothing looks good. Um, weight loss is associated with greater reduction in overall uh, dopamine content. And we really have to talk about when you make these changes, sometimes when people try to make dietary changes, they don't know what to eat and it's just easier to not eat, especially if you have a problem with apathy and motivation. Um, so I cannot emphasize enough the importance of calorie dense. You need to get enough calories during the day. Um, fat is very, very calorie dense. So more oils, um, coconut oil and olive oil were both on the good list. Um, and there's, I'll have somebody asked a question already that I'll get to on the next slide. But um, the other thing that I want to talk about is sarcopenia is this loss of muscle mass. One in five patients has um, measurable loss in muscle mass that makes um, them feel tired and weak. If they fall, it's harder to catch themselves. And overall loss of muscle mass is associated with a worsening disease. And so we really, really have to safeguard against malnutrition. Um, loss of smell is a really big deal in Parkinson's. Very few patients go into their neurologist saying, I need help with my hyposmia. Um, you don't know what you don't know. A lot of people don't even realize that they've lost their smell. And um, there was a really neat study recently done in rodents that showed um, that animals who eat the same exact amount of calories, if you damage the rodent sense of smell, they will lose weight as opposed to a, a rodent that has a good sense of smell will actually gain weight. And so I think that we are not appreciating um, how much the loss of smell is affecting our lock, loss, lock of, last, loss of appetite and our, it's interfering with our um, search for food. We're not so motivated to go and eat. And it's associated with uh, cognitive decline. So fortunately, there are a lot of ways, there are two studies now that have shown that people with Parkinson's can actually retrain their sense of smell. Um, there are these smell kits that you can order. You can get some spices from your herb drawer and 
just kind of practice, is that cinnamon or is that oregano? And you can play this game with yourself where you quiz yourself throughout the day and you can actually improve your sense of smell. Um, not only does that improve your craving of food, your ability to taste, one of the studies actually showed the higher somebody's sense of smell at, at, in Parkinson's disease, as sense of smell improved, so did quality of life improve. So uh, for people with Parkinson's that are underweight and they want to add a few pounds, um, where should they go to target nutrients? With, which of these macromolecules is most nutrient dense? Which of the eating, which of these things is most likely to make you gain weight? Okay, let's see what your answer is. Perfect. Fat it is. Um, fat has more than twice as many calories per gram as protein and carbohydrates. Um, alcohol somewhere in the middle and to the eight people who think that alcohol is their best way to put on a few pounds, I'm going to give that a thumbs down. Um, the answer is fat. For those people, and there are a lot of people who really struggle with weight loss and being underweight, um, one of the best things you can do is add some additional oils to whatever you're eating. I went to a fancy Italian restaurant recently and, um, you know, the way I, I'm used to, to the waiter or waitress coming over and asking, do you want some freshly ground pepper on that? At this restaurant, they walked over to the table and said, do you want some olive oil on that? I said, sure. And they probably dumped four tablespoons of olive oil all over my plate, over the fish, over the broccoli. And it, it was really interesting for me to see how how we in our culture just don't use olive oil like that. Um, and so things like that are easy, easy tricks. The other nice thing about fat is satiety. Um, there are kind of two ways for you to feel full. Um, you can get enough food in your stomach to stretch your stretch receptors, or you can get enough fat in your bloodstream to tell your brain that you've, you're sated, that you've had enough. And so even when I'm having grains at our house, I will add some oils to those grains just to increase their nutritional density and their, and their ability to satisfy. So one of the questions that usually comes after talks like this is how come, if this is all true, why is my neurologist not telling me that? I don't know. It's a good question. I'm trying really hard to get the attention of clinicians um, of the fourth 1,300 people registered for that. This talk, I noticed um, three of them were clinicians. So I don't know what it's going to take to get the attention of your clinicians. Uh, physicians are people too. And like anybody else, there are going to be some people who are innovators and on the progressive end of the spectrum. I can absolutely tell you there are movement disorder doctors who talk to every one of their patients about the importance of a plant-based whole foods diet. I have other neurologists who have told their patients, quote, you've already lost so much. I'm not going to take away cheeseburgers and milkshakes from you too. I mean, so in any population, there are going to be kind of the laggards who come behind and they go kicking and screaming only the, after the data has been out here for a couple decades. And there are going to be people who act a little quicker. And so the average physician got um, MD, got less than 20 hours of nutritional education as part of their medical school. And so there's just a lack of training. When we talk about, when you have a new pharmaceutical drug coming to the market, there are marketing campaigns and educational events. And there's a lot of work that goes into um, changing the mindset of physicians. We don't have pens that say, eat a Mediterranean diet. We don't, you can't patent uh, fruits and vegetables. So you don't have that same kind of industry funding moving things forward. So, so lifestyle modification in food and dietary modification just doesn't have the same um, research uh, financial drive behind it because there is no, nothing that can be patented on the other end. And we're not doing a good job um, reaching clinicians to educate them about what the data does say. So I already said all that. Um, so let's just move on to supplements quickly here. Um, not all supplements come from, not all nutrients come from food. Um, and there are a lot of reasons that uh, supplements 
may be necessary for a person with Parkinson's disease. Um, there are things like autoimmune uh, reasons why somebody might need to give themselves B shots. Um, you know, my point was not all supplements here come in pills. Some come in from sunlight. Some have to come via injection. My personal research is on a intranasal um, antioxidant as a way of targeting the brain. Uh, we sneak a little bit of iodine into your salt because the soil in the northern half of the United States doesn't have enough iodine. So there are all kinds of ways that we fortify one nutritional status and it's not always coming from the the supplement shelf at the health food store so um, not all supplements are safe right and when we talk about side effects um, not all side effects are physical and the cost coenzyme q10 is really expensive and for a long time i had patients who were spending you know 400 plus dollars a month on high dose coenzyme q10 because they got excited about it and so there may have not been physical side effects associated with supplementing with coenzyme Q10, there were financial side effects. Um, some supplements have drug nutrient interactions um, and there could be contraindications that you don't necessarily realize. Coenzyme Q10 and warfarin can interact with each other. Iron supplements can make your meds not work well. Um, so I really do think that um, you need to involve your physician in these conversations, um, but the what our data shows is that the supplements associated with the fastest rate of Parkinson's progression were iron supplements and melatonin. So let's talk about those for a minute. Iron is not surprising. Um, there are a lot of reasons why that makes sense. Um, and so what I would encourage you to do is if, um, if your physician has told you you have iron deficiency anemia and you need a short-term iron supplement, Take it, do what your physician tells you to do. But if you are doing your own self-prescribing, make sure your multivitamin does not have iron in it. Make sure that somebody at the health food store, you know, you said, I'm fatigued. They said, oh, take iron. Um, I do think that you should avoid iron unless your physician tells you otherwise. Melatonin um, was a little scary because so many people use melatonin and claim to benefit from melatonin. The research suggests that melatonin might be very protective for the brain. It certainly is associated with improved sleep. Um, and we know that people with Parkinson's don't get the same melatonin surge in the middle of the night that non-Parkinson's people get. So um, we were concerned about this melatonin association. And so we looked a little further and what happened was we learned from our data that it's the people with bad sleep that are taking melatonin. And it's not the melatonin that was associated with the bad night, with the faster progression. It was the bad sleep that was associated with, with faster progression. So as soon as we looked at bad sleepers and we compared those who were and were not taking melatonin, melatonin actually helped. So I, I do not consider melatonin a risk factor um, for progression. I, I think that that one can be explained by a, a bad sleep is what is actually driving that association. But more research needs to be done. Um, there were three supplements that people reported taking that were associated with statistically slower rates of Parkinson's progression, glutathione, fish oil, and coenzyme Q10. Um, we don't know doses. We don't know brands. Um, we don't, it could be that the people who are well informed enough to know about glutathione and coenzyme Q10 are not reflective of the typical population. They're doing more research. They're following more literature um, and they're have more social connections online. They're learning from their peers. And so it could that be that these three supplements aren't slowing progression, but something about the type of person who's using them. So again, this is all more research that needs to be done, but um, the short answer here is there are three supplements associated with slower Parkinson's progression. And I will just um, stress, I do not want all of you to run out to the supplement store. These cost money. They can interact with some of your medications. Um, they're largely safe. And I do think that they are probably for most people, a reasonable place to start in the world of what supplements should I take, if any, for Parkinson's disease but I think that's a conversation you need to have with your physicians. Okay, last quiz. Um, supplements are so much safer than pharmaceuticals. You can run out to the local health food store and just start taking whatever you want without physician supervision. I set this one up. I expect this one to be 
<laughs> Beautiful. Exactly. Exactly. And so there's a little bit of a catch 22 that this is the right answer. They're not, there, there are side effects and there are risks to taking supplements. And I will also say 50% of the supplements sold over the counter don't even have in them what the label says they have in them. It's not just that the supplements or the vitamin or nutrient or herb or whatever's in there might or might not have an interaction. What you think you're taking might not even be what you're taking. Um, so I do want you to involve your physicians in this decision. If you go rogue and do something on your own, I do want you to let your provider know what you've been doing. Um, and the other thing I want you to do is have an honest conversation with your physician about their comfort level with this. If, if your physician has never studied nutritional medicine and doesn't know what some of the supplements that you're taking are, that's fine. That doesn't make them a bad doc. Keep them for what they're good at. But I do think you need to involve somebody in your healthcare team who has been properly trained in nutrition. So here's the take home. Um, in my opinion, I don't think that there is a huge risk associated with making more friends and eating more plants and exercise and things like that. When I weigh the potential risks and the potential benefits of adopting um, kind of the, the plan as, as told by these data, I think that it is reasonable to say that the potential benefits outweigh the potential risks. Um, in summary, I would say shift towards a plant-based whole foods, Mediterranean type diet exercise for at least 30 minutes every single day, nurture your relationships, um, push yourself to have something on your agenda, uh, something with a friend, maybe wait till this whole virus thing has died down a little bit, but really um, have, have something on your schedule every day because being a, a part of a, of a community in and of itself is medicine. Protect your sleep like your life depends on it. You have to get a good night's sleep. And that's something that you can have an entire visit with your physician, primary care or neurologist talking about, hey, can you help me come up with some strategies to improve my night of sleep? When you wake up in the morning, you should say, I feel rested. And um, don't be shy about talking to your physician about if or whether you should take any sort of supplements. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. I'll take questions. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Mishley. That was a, a fabulous talk and, and I think uh, provoked a lot of uh, uh, questions that came through. And I uh, want to be able to just uh, talk to them uh, briefly about that. And uh, if you want to get in contact with uh, Dr. Mishley, her email is right there on the thank you slide, info at educationismedicine.com. Um, so we've got a bunch of questions that have come through. And you know, one of them, uh, I think, uh, in light of what's going on around us, you, your data was really interesting, and that's about um, loneliness. Um, how do you achieve that in this situation where we have social distancing? distancing and what would you suggest uh, that people might do in order to maintain that kind of uh, interaction? Um, so the phone is fabulous. I think more pe I've heard many people tell me that they're calling relatives that they haven't talked to in months this week because they're all holed up and they're reaching out to people. I don't think you need to be physically touching somebody to feel socially connected to them. Um, I have a couple kids in junior high right now. They think the phone is archaic. They only use FaceTime. <laughs> if you want to call somebody, it, they, they never call somebody without looking at them. That's just how they communicate. There, there is face-to-face -face communication, even when they're talking on the phone. And so I think technology is enabling a way to be a part of a community. I think that there are some, there are some exercise programs. I think uh, Nate Coomer has one called the Parkinson's Fitness Project. And it's called the Daily Dose. And it's 20 minutes a day, I think he posts. But, you know, patients are all in on it. They can see each other working out. They're exercising together. And you can have people around the world participating in a class. And they feel like they're in this together. They're cracking jokes. They can hear people talking amongst themselves. So I think technology is the answer to that. What we're doing here is a form of community. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I, you bring up, uh, you know, FaceTime. Uh, I understand now it can, you can... Uh, do video with multiple people. WhatsApp is another popular application that people can use to do these types of video uh, conversations. So, um, you know, it's one of those things uh, that really keeps in, um, um, you know, it can keep people together at the very least. Um, I just want to highlight what's on the screen. We've got um, a couple uh, uh, 
events for educational. I guess we've just ran off the slides, uh, but just uh, simply to let you know that we've got um, uh, different things for, for our professionals, healthcare professionals are, are there. Some of the things are gonna have to be adjusted because of what's going on with the virus. Um, and so just stay tuned for that. Uh, we're keeping uh, track of that. Uh, for instance, many of our in-person events that we had planned as a foundation for uh, this month are, are being postponed or canceled. So uh, we will keep uh, everyone up to date as far as that goes. Um, the next slide showed uh, um, uh, something that we do all the time. Uh, we always are engaging with our community and we want them to help us decide what should be the next uh, round of expert briefings. Uh, believe it or not, we rely on the community, the listeners here today um, who are participating in Dr. Mishley's um, uh, webinar to understand what we should do for next year. So please, uh, click uh, the survey in the um, Q and A, uh, sorry, in the chat. Uh, there's a link now to the expert briefing uh, survey. So you can choose some uh, different uh, options that are available so that we can plan for next year. So Dr. Mishley, some more questions are coming in. You know, that was a really interesting um, a graph you presented about the foods associated with PD progression. I noticed there were a lot of bad foods and not many green foods. Um, how'd that work out? Um, there seemed is that just a, a, a luck of the draw? Yeah, I'm just the messenger. We used a p-value less than 0.05, and what's on the list is on the list. So. Okay, so the list is broader than what actually uh, the results. Okay, yeah. that's good to know. So, and what was fascinating, I mean, like pasta was on the bad list, but bread was not. Bread was neutral. Eggs were neutral. Chicken's on the bad list. Turkey's not. Is there something about them? Or maybe not enough people are eating turkey that we're not seeing it in the data. Maybe nobody's doing drive-through fried turkey. And so it's not the chicken, but the way the chicken's being prepared. I mean, there are a lot of questions that still need to be answered. So this is just kind of first pass. Yeah, I totally understand that. So we had some, uh, as you know, we have a number of health professionals on the line and they were just curious ab uh, about uh, your study. Did you track anything about socioeconomic status or um, whether other activities like exercise that people are engaged in as part of this study? Oh yeah, yeah, we're, we're looking at tons of different variables. Um, what is fascinating here is in research world, um, income and education typically go hand in hand. And what is fascinating in our 2,200 people with Parkinson's is education has no bearing on rate of Parkinson's progression, but income had a tremendous impact on progression. And so for the data that we presented, they were all adjusted based on somebody's income levels. We did take that into account in the statistical analysis, but I, I'm not sure that even that adjustment does the question justice. I think it's a, it's a really tough thing to take into account. And I think that when you, um, I'm, we're trying to get some fancier statisticians involved who can kind of help us look into isolation, loneliness, exercise, and income. And, and once you kind of take all of those things into, impact, into account, what's, how does, what's left with the dietary stuff? Absolutely. Uh, that's a really good point. So I've got another couple questions to ask about the red versus green, but just want to highlight again for our audience, uh, the resources the foundation has available. We're the only organization with a helpline, 1-800-4PD-INFO. Tons of fact sheets on nutrition and Parkinson's disease. Uh, Dr. Mishley's played a role in those. Our podcasts, and we have a wear and care kit. Um, and so, you know, please, uh, you know, consider uh, looking to uh, request one of those as well. So, you know, you, I thought you'd address nicely this issue that many people with PD experience, um, and it's often two-pronged. One is this loss of weight um, that people can experience. And then also uh, concomitant to that is often uh, loss of appetite because they can't smell their food and enjoy it as before. Um, but you know, a lot of the red foods are the ones that have that, um, as you pointed out, the fats that are uh, dense in the calories that they need. Um, how do you recommend um, you know people try to balance that? If if you know there's one uh, person who said they were 244 pounds and now have dropped 175 pounds, um, you know what what's how do they do this? Because I, I don't know how much olive oil you would need in order to really um, you know make up um, this type of uh, these types of fats. So it, it doesn't. We have no reason to believe that eating more fried chicken and ice cream is the solution to weight loss in Parkinson's disease, right? Like, I mean, just because you can get fat eating those foods doesn't mean that people who have malabsorption issues can eat those foods and, and necessarily um, gain weight. 
So um, I think there are a couple different ways. Instead of turning to um, fatty and salty as your flavors, I think there are ways to put more fresh herbs and spices in your food, more, more cinnamon, more clove. If you're going to have oatmeal, put some clove on there, I mean, or some cinnamon on there. I mean, there are ways to, to get that nutrient density. And we're not talking a change in calories. It is actually very easy to get the same number of calories. I will say that when people switch, you know, I'm, I'm 19 years now into my clinical practice of teaching people to switch kind of from the red list to the green list. And I will tell you that what happens is the first thing that happens is people's bowel fun function improves. And when you're constipated and it, food doesn't look good um, between, you know, once you start eating a plant-based diet that helps your bowel movements a lot, people become less constipated, their meds start working a lot better. It becomes easier to move and stay motivated. If you feel bad, if you're rigid and stiff, it is hard to stand at the counter and chop veggies, right? And so it ends up being, um, it, it ends up being that it it's doesn't necessarily translate to a reduction in calories. Um, and so you can actually add more oils. And, and I'll even send people, you know, to, to treat, you can have treats too. You can have coconut bliss instead of ice cream. You know, you can, there are ways to get some calorie dense, um, savory, delicious foods that are almost junk foods, but they're still on the good list. Okay, that's fantastic. You know, we had a dietitian uh, uh, wrote in, and uh, this person's worried about, uh, you know, coconut oil uh, because there's a lot of concern about saturated fats and increased risk of LDL cholesterol and cardiovascular disease. You know, are there other oils to consider, like avocado oil, or you know, again, you know, other things that might be helpful um, as part of this effort? So, so it. Cholesterol comes from animal products. So if we're worried about people's cholesterol, the first thing we should be worried about is reduction, reducing their intake of animal products. I mean, co coconut intake, oil intake is kind of lower on the priority list. Um, in Parkinson's disease, when I work with my patients, every one of my patients at baseline gets a blood test and we know their cholesterol levels. And, and if somebody has hyperlipidemia, we talk about maybe coconut oil isn't a great idea for you for the following reasons. Um, but it's not as simple. We're not talking to the general population here. Um, because I, uh, in the Parkinson's research, it actually looks that like low cholesterol might be more harmful than high cholesterol. I'm not encouraging anybody to go out and raise their lipids to a cardiovascular risk zone. Um, but, but it, the, the epidemiologic data actually calls into question whether or not higher cholesterol might be a little protective in Parkinson's disease. So it's not what you're reading in the newspapers for the general population may not be applicable as much as you'd think to patients with Parkinson's. Okay, we're almost at the top of the, the hour and, and I know you've got to go for another engagement. Just a couple quick rapid fire questions if I can, uh, just to see if we can answer them. So deep fried versus sauteed? Um, use oils that are high, have a high boiling point, high heat oils. You can find lists online. And to the extent that you can cook them at lower temperatures, slow and low, the better. You want to avoid high heat for, for delicate oils. Got it. What about dry beans versus canned beans? Uh, dry. Doesn't matter? Dry. dry. Uh, cakes and pastries? Can you still get some treats? Sweets were on the neutral list. So okay. um, I measure people's blood sugar and I say, keep your hemoglobin A1C down. But if your blood sugar is low, don't be afraid of a little bit of sugar here and there. That's fantastic. People have heard me speak before. I talk a lot about pound cake, which is a, a real favorite of mine. What about uh, eggs and coffee? They were um, eggs and coffee were both on the neutral list. They neither accelerated or were associated with slower progression. And what about, is goat milk the same as cow's milk? I mean, because there's someone asking about goat milk and cheese and kefir. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, the truth is we don't have enough people eating goat milk and camel milk and sheep milk to be able to see the data if they're different. Um, but my hunch is it's probably not. We have people arguing unpasteurized versus pasteurized. I mean, there are a whole bunch of organic versus not. Um, it's going to be at least five, 10 more years before we have enough people in this study. And please consider joining the study, by the way. Um, enough people in this study to be able to see those differences. So until that data comes in, I'm going to say just avoid all mammalian milk-based products. 
Okay. Dr. Mishka, I want to thank you for your time today. Great presentation. Uh, just remember that we have the online survey there for those who can provide feedback for us. We have our Facebook Live event uh, tomorrow with um, uh, our two clinicians talking about uh, COVID and Parkinson's disease. That's 10 a.m. Uh, tomorrow on Wednesday. And then tune in for our next webinar. It's on April 14th, um, PD and medication. What's new with Dr. Fernando Pagan um, from Georgetown University. Um, so for everyone out there, please be safe, be healthy, and uh, look forward to talking to you again in, in April. Take care. Bye-bye.